let me use an example. Um, you're not an American. No, I right? am not. But you could be an American. You I could, could be an American because your mother and father were Americans. They came up here in 1971, and you were born in 1986. I know you weren't, but you're in, born in 1987, and you're an American automatically because your parents were were Americans. And you've never lived in the States. You've never been to the States. You don't even like the States because you went to some funny school where the teachers all told you how bad Americans are. Mm. And you don't even like Americans. But you are an American citizen. And as an American citizen, you are going down to the state sometimes and they don't want to let you in and you say, wait a minute, you can't keep me out, I'm an American citizen. My parents are American, so you forced yourself across the border when they tried to turn you back by saying you're an American citizen. Well, one out of ten of the American border guys now, and this happens every day, one out of ten American border guys are now trained to be able to look up citizenship, they can look up income, to whether you've been filing oh, your, your income IRS tax. Records? And we had one fellow that, uh, his name, his initial was ML, I'm not going to give his name, but he's given me permission to use his name. He got a $216,000 tax bill by that sort of exact kind of thing. So, or you're, you're an American, you came up here as a draft dodger, you're still an American citizen, they restored everything, they gave you amnesty and all the rest of that stuff, you're an American citizen, you become a Canadian, but you're still an American. And uh, your son is an American automatically, your daughter's an American automatically because you were in the States long enough. And they're going across the border. And they don't even particularly know that they're an American, but they have a problem at the border. And our kids tend to have problems at the border once in a while. So they bring up the fact that you're the American. As you know, I've got a Haight-Ashbury sign and I was, I was there and I can remember it because I didn't do drugs. Anyway, making a long story short, um, because your kid gets caught at the border, proves they're an American, gets into the States when they try to stop them, you are now in the IRS clutches. So they send you a little notice saying, you've got to file tax returns. And you say, they've caught you. You mm -hmm. didn't come forward voluntarily. I'm right. going to make a comment. We've never had a client that came forward voluntarily, penalized or fined. But lots of them, every day, somebody phones up who's being penalized and fined. If you have something simple like a $50,000 RRSP, that's not a lot of money. Lots of people got $50,000 RRSPs. They may have left their company and rolled it over. The penalty for being an American with an RRSP in Canada and not filing notice with the U.S. Treasury Department and filing a form with the IRS, you ready for this? The official penalty, minimum $10,000, plus 35,000, this is per year, plus $35,000, 35% of the amount in the RRSP, plus 5% for every year you didn't report it. Well, you can see that if you've had 100000 and you've been up here for 14 years and... Uh, you don't have any money left. You've got one well, who's still on tax to Canada when you take it out, too. Right. And right. this is very real penalties. And I've got on my website 15 people that have all been penalized in the last while through the United Bank of Switzerland, the Union Bank of Switzerland, the UBS thing, because U.S. Treasury and the Canadian uh, CRA are all going after people that were in UBS and hiding their money. Nobody said this was going to be easy, but we are privileged to have David Ingram, international tax expert, with us on the Money and Wealth Show today. And we'll be right back with lots more. Stay with us. Good afternoon. My name is Larry Ray. I'm the president and CEO of American Manganese Inc., a company that's operating a manganese discovery at Atillery Peak, Arizona. Currently, we have a resource of about 11 billion pounds of manganese, which currently trades at $1.30 a pound. We have a 43101 economic evaluation that shows it to have very robust returns with the potential of being the lowest cost producer in the world at 45 cents a pound. Our plans are to push this project further by drilling 191 drill holes in the next six months, entailing some 62,000 feet or 15 to 16,000 meters of drilling. American Manganese Inc. currently trades under the ticker symbol AMY or AMY on the TSX Venture Exchange. If you'd like more information on us, visit us at our site AmericanManganeseInc.com or give us a call at 604-531-9636.
Welcome back to the Money and Wealth Show. Our special guest this week is tax expert David Ingram. And David, last week on the show we did with David Skarika, you talked about tax, I'm sorry, stock inside an RRSP and its taxability. Well, uh, Expand I on that well, if you would, please. I, I, you know, when I first got into this business back in 66, 64, the, I went to work for a guy named Russ Isaac, a great Pacific management, and we didn't have capital gains tax. And I can still remember sitting in the great Pacific management office at 11, I think it was 1170 Melville Street, and Russ making sure, pounding into our heads, that you were not to put stock in an RRSP. And the reason was that you, stock wasn't taxable, capital gains weren't taxable. But if you put your stock into an RSP and it went up in value, you had to pay tax on it. Uh, when you took it out. Why, yeah, why would you put stock in? Expose it well, to unnecessary tax. That's right. right. Today, you still only have to pay tax on 50% of stock, but you still don't want to put it into an RSP because you put it into an RSP, you pay tax on 100%. Let me use a little example. Do you remember BREX? Sure. BREX is a big deal. I mean, I knew David Walsh. I met Guzman. I met all those guys because of different seminars I went to. And... We had one client in particular who bought $1,000 worth of Briex, and when it was worth $10,000, he rolled it into an RRSP, and it was literally worth $967,000 when he died. Can I change 967 to a million dollars right now? Okay. Okay, just for the fun of it. Sure, sure. Round, he, it, round them off. Yeah. If he cashes the $967,000 RRSP in, as his daughter did when he died and got it out before the Briex value fell, <clears throat> the tax on that million dollars is 44 percent, four hundred and forty thousand mm -hmm. dollars. But if he hadn't put it into the RSP, remember it was only a thousand bucks that he bought in the first place. He'd have nine hundred ninety-nine thousand dollars worth of capital gains, cut it in half, five hundred thousand, only pays two hundred twenty thousand dollars tax instead oh, of four hundred forty. Okay. Right. So how much money did he save by putting it into the RSP? About four thousand bucks. Was it worth four thousand dollars to have to pay an extra two hundred twenty thousand dollars worth of tax? Now, Briex was sort of a crazy thing, and they never paid dividends. But let's say you buy just some nice Bank of Montreal stock, or Royal Bank, or CIBC, or something, all the stock. That the blue they, chip stuff. Yeah, the good stuff, the, the Canada Pension Plan that we're all part of. That's what they're buying up right now. Mm -hmm. So you buy that. Well, they pay a dividend every year. And that's for the sake of argument. Say you're, you're 30 years old, you buy $10,000 worth of stock, and over the next 35 years until you hit 65, which I am now, you uh, suddenly you've made a... $60,000 worth of dividends on the stock because it just paid $600, you know, just went up and up and up and increased in value. Well, when you got the dividends, if it was in your own name, the dividend tax credit means it's almost tax paid money, right? You get the dividend, you put it on your tax return, you get a dividend tax credit because the company paid tax, it's tax free or just about tax free. But when it's in your RSP, you pay tax on 100% of it. Full rates. So you pay tax on 100% of the capital gains, you pay tax on 100% of the dividends. It just doesn't work. In fact, I can prove mathematically that just about nobody should ever buy an RRSP. That's a whole other story. Well, uh, uh, and you're right. That's a, whole, that's a whole other show. And maybe we'll get to that one day. I'd okay. like to do that. But in the meantime, the, uh, I'm gathering from this, and the advice is avoid putting any stock inside any RRSP. Yeah, the only good stock to put, you know what the good stock to put in an RSP is? What's that? Stock that's going to go down. Are you going to buy stock that's going to go down intentionally? Not likely. So you don't put it in an RSP. It's, just, it's very simple. Okay, because if you do put the stock, let's say you buy $10,000 worth of stock and you put it in your RSP, and it becomes worth nothing. Well, you got a 100% write-off for the $10,000 because when you put in the RSP, you got a deduction. But if you put the $10,000 stock in there, it becomes worth $100,000, you owe $20,000 $20, extra tax than if you hadn't put it in the RSP. Well, now, your, 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 your personal feelings about the legitimacy of RRSP investments aside, if you're not putting stock into an RSP, what then should you focus on putting into that plan? Well, almost nothing, you see, because if you are trying to make money and get ahead, and the kind of person I think would be watching this show as a rule maybe buy mining stocks and this type of thing, uh, you don't want that in the RSP, right? Just don't want it there. And putting interest-bearing stuff in doesn't make an awful lot of stuff either because it's not going to keep you out of inflation and be there for you when you retire. So RSPs are a really tricky member. Lots more to come on this week's edition of the Money and Wealth Show. We'll be right back.